Hi, this is Mr. Gideon. So now we're going to talk about making a market. And one of the things you want to do is make sure that you envision not just potentially physical marketplaces where buyers and sellers can come together, but of course over the internet because that's where a lot of transactions take place today. We've got a couple of examples of markets here. The first one is the market for butter. Normally if I was going to ask you to create a graph yourself, I'd expect you to put a title up here uh, above the graph so it would say market for butter price along this axis, quantity along this axis, and it doesn't matter what product or service there is, that's where the labels go. Um, and as you know from our previous discussions, there's some tension between the two sides. The sellers are willing to provide, sell a greater quantity as the price rises in the marketplace, and so there's a direct relationship between price and quantity, and we see this upward sloping curve in so many situations it indicates that. If you're a demander though, as the price rises, you're willing to demand less and less. And so these two sides have different interests. The question is, how do we create a market? Well, by having some kind of middle ground where the sellers and the demanders can agree on a price and a quantity. So in theory for this example, if we looked at a dollar being uh, a price that could prevail in this marketplace, According to these numbers, this is the equilibrium or meeting place that the two sides would say, sure, let's go ahead and do a transaction, and that transaction would total 10 million pounds of butter in this marketplace. But this meeting place, this middle ground where the two sides can agree and then do some kind of a trade exchange transaction is commonly referred to as the equilibrium. Sometimes it's known as the market equilibrium, the market clearing price, the equilibrium price and quantity all of those things are interchangeable. But when you talk about the meeting place, you always want to try to keep in mind what is the price and the quantity that we're talking about. If you scroll down here, you'll see another example with some specific numbers. In this case, this would be the market for rent or the market for apartments that are going on a rent basis. And for uh, $1,000 a month. This is the quantity of apartments or number of units in millions in this marketplace for apartments um, that would be transacted or traded or exchanged for money. So in this example, two million. But like I've said before, we don't always use specific numbers uh, to represent supply and demand. Here's a, a more generic one. And as I've also said before, sometimes the curves look straight, sometimes the curves look curvy. So it's an example of curvy curves in this situation. This would be a market for coffee beans, but once again, an equilibrium price and an equilibrium quantity that emerge where the supply and the demand intersect. So <clears throat> keeping that in mind, what can change that equilibrium price and quantity? Well, very simply, the equilibrium price and quantity can change if the supply, the, cur <coughs> the supply curve or the demand curve or both change. And we've talked before about the factors that can shift these curves. Remember that the, a change in price for the product or service that we're talking about in that marketplace, if that changes, that will only cause us to slide from one point to another along the existing curve. It will not cause the entire curve to shift and be redrawn to the right or the left. There's a whole host of other factors that we've talked about that would cause these curves potentially to shift to the right or left, ceteris paribus. So let's look at a couple of brief examples of this. Sticking with the coffee market, let's say that there was some factor that caused the demand curve, starting at D sub 1, to shift and be redrawn to the right, now labeled as D sub 2, which of course is an increase in demand. One of the factors we've discussed before is uh, an increase in the number of demanders of coffee. So let's say that factor took place uh, that would cause the demand curve to shift and be redrawn to the right. Maybe preferences for coffee uh, shifted and more people now compared to the past want to drink coffee as opposed to other energy drinks or tea drinks. There's a whole host of factors that could be in play but if the demand curve shifts to the right like this and becomes redrawn now of course the intersection point the equilibrium point in this marketplace is in a different spot where now D sub 2 and our original supply curve intersect at a higher price point as well as a higher or greater quantity. So for this example, if demand shifts to the right, what happens to the price of coffee in the marketplace? It increases, of course, and the quantity also increases. If something 
<clears throat> else happened that caused demand to shift to the left, then both of those things would decrease. The equilibrium price would decrease and the equilibrium quantity in the coffee market would also decrease. Of course, there could be some kind of a change in supply. Let's say that this supply curve and demand curve met here at the equilibrium point originally, and then, oh, the number of suppliers in the coffee market decreased. Let's say a bunch of them went out of business. This is a matter of fact, uh, something that's actually happened. And if you consider Higher Grounds Cafe at Chaminade, one of those companies that are part of the larger marketplace, which they have been for the last four years roughly, they went out of business. That would be one of many examples within this larger phenomenon of supply of coffee decreasing. So it shifts to the left and it has to be redrawn. Now there's a new equilibrium point. What does that mean? Well, read your graph. Draw a new supply curve to the left if you were going to be doing this by hand and read where the new equilibrium point is. In this example, of course, the equilibrium price is going to increase and the equilibrium quantity in the marketplace is going to decrease. But of course, supply could shift to the right. It could increase. Whether it's because the number of sellers that are in the coffee market increases from where it was or let's say the cost of inputs decreases there's a whole host of factors, of course, as I said, that we've already discussed. So the bottom line is if you're being asked a question about how some factor increases the equilibrium price and quantity in some market, the market for coffee, the market for eyeglasses, the market for uh, computer repair services, for legal services, it doesn't really matter what the market is. The general order is ask yourself which curve is going to shift, which way, draw that shift and then read your new equilibrium point for price and quantity. It's possible, as we scroll down here, you'll see this, that you could have more than one curve shift. The question is, well, now what happens with price and quantity? It depends on whether you're giving enough, given enough information to, to determine that. If you get a question that says, well, you know, demand increases and supply decreases and you're not being told how much each one does, then one of your factors, the price or quantity, might be impossible to determine how much they've changed or in which direction. But these examples are specific. On the left it says, well, here's one possible outcome. Let's say there's a small decrease in supply, but a greater, <clears throat> larger increase in demand. If demand moves to the right more than supply moves to the left, you do that, you read your graph, and you see the price of coffee is going to rise as well as the quantity. If you have another situation, let's say supply decreases more than demand increases, then you would be clearly able to answer that question as well. Price increases, quantity decreases. Now, this is assuming that in these marketplaces you have a freely operating market where suppliers and demanders can make their own decisions about what price they want to conduct transactions and trades at. But sometimes the government steps in and says, we're not going to let the marketplace determine what prices and quantities are going to be used as transaction points on their own for various reasons. So these are what we call price controls when the government steps in. And there's two kinds of price controls you need to know, ceilings and floors. So what's a price ceiling? A price ceiling is a government mandated ma maximum price above which legal trades cannot be made. Price ceilings lead to shortages. So sometime, sometimes people get confused, frequently they do, because they say, okay, so a price control is where the government steps in and says you can't have the normal equilibrium price and quantity. It's going to be set at a price below or above equilibrium. Hey, where do I find price ceiling? It's got to be above, right? Because in the physical world, wherever I'm sitting or standing, the ceiling's always up high and the floor is down low. But that's not the case in economics. You have to retrain your thinking and think about the function of a floor or a ceiling. A ceiling perhaps this helps you visualize this, is something that you can't rise above. If you had a great vertical jump and you could jump higher than 8 or 10 feet, which is where the physical ceiling is found wherever you are in the physical world, <clears throat> that ceiling stops you from jumping any higher. What about a floor? A floor provides a physical object below which you cannot sink anymore. 
So because of that, you need to think about the purpose of the ceilings and the floors. In this example, you can see the ceiling is not found above equilibrium. It's found below equilibrium. Why? Because of the purpose of a ceiling. A ceiling prevents you from rising higher, and if you put it above the equilibrium, well, that wouldn't accomplish the goal of the ceiling. So this would be a market, for instance, for rent or for apartments for rent. And an example of this in the real world could be Santa Monica. For several years, they've had rent control. They say, well, maybe normally the monthly rent that would prevail, that the average person would pay in Santa Monica if they wanted to live near the beach, would be a thousand bucks a month. But in Santa Monica, we think that price is too high. We want to have some people who are either poor or have uh, jobs that provide them modest means to still be able to afford to live near the beach. So we're going to set up a price control, in this case a price ceiling, of $800 a month. And we're going to tell landlords you cannot charge by law more than 800 bucks a month because once you go higher than that, then only the middle class or the wealthy, let's just say for the sake of argument, can afford those apartments. And that's not what we want Santa Monica to be about. But of course, if you charge less than what the normal equilibrium is going to be because of law, what are you going to have? Well, in this example, at $800 a month, all right, the supply is going to be less than what it normally would be, and you have greater demand. If you go to that point on the demand curve over here, because people go, wow, dude, did you hear that they're only charging 800 bucks a month to live in Santa Monica? I'm there. You're going to have a shortage. The, that housing is going to be in short supply, literally. So normally when you have a ceiling, and the government quite often knows that they're getting themselves into this territory, when you have a ceiling, um, you're going to have a shortage. But it might be something that the government says we're willing to accept because of certain principles in play. Price floor, as I just said, has the opposite effect. This is something that you cannot go below. If you're standing on a floor in the physical world, you can't go below it. If you have a price floor, we're saying that this is a price below which you are not allowed to legally charge. So what about in the butter market? Let's say that the government believes that butter farmers need to make a certain amount of money to survive. And so even though normally the equilibrium would be a dollar per pound, we're going to set a law in place that says the, uh, the least that somebody can buy this butter at is $1.20 per pound. Well, in that case, just like with many other floors, the government might be aware of this, but they're okay with what's going to happen, which is a surplus. The price is higher than where it would normally be, so demanders are going to say, uh, no thank you, I'm not going to buy as much butter, at least some of these demanders. Maybe they'll buy a substitute product like margarine, or they'll use mayonnaise instead of butter on some of their products. Um, the suppliers think it's good news, at least those that are still in business, but you're going to have a surplus. So for price ceilings, what goes hand in hand with a price ceiling is a shortage. With a price floor, you have a surplus. Here's another example of a floor. If you look over here at the labeling, this refers to a wage floor that is above the wage equilibrium. And this is something that perhaps you've directly experienced. Minimum wage law. The equilibrium in the labor market might be lower than what minimum wage is providing for young people in particular. But the, the government in uh, the United States says, you know what, we're going to set a law that says you cannot pay below a certain amount. In the state of California, that minimum wage is even higher than the federal standard. And so if the government believes, you know what, even if we're going to have an excess of labor, it's worth it to have this wage floor in place. And so minimum wage is an example of having one of these floors <clears throat> that you can't go below. But of course, what comes with that is a surplus of labor. And uh, I'm not saying that the minimum wage is what's contributed to the high unemployment rate we have right now. Uh, but when you have a floor in place like that, chances are you're going to have some unemployment. You're going to have some people with uh, the inability to find jobs. So whether you're talking about leftover butter or you're talking about leftover coffee or leftover uh, employment uh, possibilities for people, uh, we're, those are all potential examples of excess supply or surplus. Now, if you have a surplus like this in the coffee market or even a shortage, 
they are not necessarily things that were instituted by the government. In the short term, we have these fluctuations in the market because it's, the marketplace is not a perfect place, of course. People make decisions and estimations about what might be best for them to sell, what price to sell at if they're an entrepreneur, or what price to buy at as a demander, as a buyer, and then they change their mind over time. Um, and so you want to keep in mind that surpluses and shortages do happen naturally in markets whether or not the government gets involved and uh, sets floors and ceilings in place. So what happens when there is a surplus or a shortage and there's no law in place that's saying, you know, due to a floor or ceiling, the price cannot fluctuate? Well, what happens is if... Um, well, the price is going to fall when there's a surplus because suppliers adjust to seeing that extra inventory. Um, the price will rise when there's a shortage because suppliers adjust to selling out so fast. Once again, if you've taken business economics, you've participated in the promenade, you know that in our class, for the first 15 minutes of the sale, you have to stick with the price you said you were going to charge. But after the first 15 minutes, you can make adjustments. And if you're a seller sitting there and you see that people are just running to your booth to get your stuff you start to think well maybe I charge too too low a price and you adjust and you write you raise your price after the first 15 minutes or however long you're going to be in business thereafter conversely in the first 15 minutes if people are walking by and going uh, no thanks oh gosh that's really expensive then you'll start to adjust business owners that are in business as a career do the same kinds of things and in the scope of the marketplace, those kinds of adjustments take place. Owners see that they have leftover inventory or a surplus. They see that their inventory is getting snatched up too quickly. They have a shortage. And so over time, if we have an economic system where wages and prices are flexible, the market can adjust. Remember, consumer sovereignty. In the long term, the consumers choose where the prices are going to be because they're the ones that decide whether or not to buy what the sellers are going to be selling. But not all of these markets equilibrate at the same speed. They don't all necessarily get to their natural equilibrium point at the same speed. It differs from market to market. So in review for chapter three, here are some really important terms. And remember, once again, demand includes quantity demanded, but is not the same thing as demand. If you have a change in quantity demanded, that is not the same thing as a change in demand. Same thing for supply. A change in quantity supplied is not the same thing as a change in supply. A change in the price of a good or service never causes the demand or supply for that good or service to change or shift right or left. And I'll just plant a seed for one other market that we're going to come back to many times actually in this class. The market for money. If you're going to borrow money, then you would be demanding money or demanding a loan. If you're going to be supplying money, you would have a supply curve as well. So in this market, this is what we call the money market, you could have supply curves that are vertical actually in this case and a demand curve similar to the ones you've seen before what would the price of loans or the price of money be well whenever we can be more specific than just labeling this axis price we try to do so in this case it would be the interest rate because of course we know there's no such thing as free that especially includes money people charge a price on money they charge a price on loans which we all know is the interest rate so this is still an axis of price here's your quantity axis but I just wanted to expose this to you uh, briefly and then later in the class we'll come back to it